thank you for coming on dr acknan uh this is enjoy your 24 um let's just get into it so what i i know you're a social psychologist and you teach at sfu i had a class with you uh psychology 391 selected topics uh science of happiness um if you can just explain a little bit more of what you do and uh, the type of research you do. Sure. So as you mentioned, I'm a social psychologist and I am particularly interested in how people can live socially connected and happy lives. And so to that end, my research focuses primarily on um, the social relationships that we build with other people. Um, one particular means for how we do that, which is engaging in kind or generous behavior and how that may result and support our well-being. Right. So, and from what um, the research I've done on you and uh, from what we learned in that class uh when i took it with you uh it, that that's what you would call pro-social uh behavior or pro-social spending um so what does that really mean pro-social behavior in general pro-social behavior is a label for actions taken to improve the benefits to improve the stake or situation of another person. Um, so a lot of my research, as you mentioned, has focused on pro-social spending, which is using our financial resources to improve the stake of someone else. So that could be charitable giving. It can be treating friends and family to coffee, to dinner, um, using our financial resources to help others. But there are lots of other ways that we can help other people. It's not just financial. Uh, we have many resources at our disposal. So we can invest our time. We can invest our energy. We can invest our uh, blood, our organs. We can give food to other people. Um, basically, any resource we have to give away, we, we can. And so I broadly think of pro-sociality or pro-social behavior as using our resources to benefit others. And, and that can, as I say, take on a wide range of, of options and resources to give. Right. And that was one of the questions because I, I wrote some notes down and I was wondering, is it so pro-social spending is actually have, you know, spending money on the other person. There's a transactional, well, not a transactional, it's a one-way, um, essentially, investment into the other person, correct? Yes, although I think some new research also looks at earning money for the benefit of other people, which we've kind of broadly considered a form of pro-social spending as well. But I think most traditional forms of pro-social spending, we would think about people giving away or using their money to help other people. Yeah. Right. And what were some of the studies that you uh, conducted? And um, because I, I, I know of it um, just very briefly, but if you could go into it. Sure. So a lot of my research on this topic has spanned um, over a decade. So I'll tell you a few of my favorites um, and hopefully that will illustrate the larger concept. So um, my colleagues and I have been very interested in how generosity makes the actor or the person who's engaging in the act of generosity feel. And we've been focusing primarily on pro-social spending. So using your money to benefit another person. And so some of the first research we did on this topic looked at um, how people felt after spending relatively small sums of money on other people or themselves. And for that original study, we recruited students at UBC, where I was at the time. We went out in the morning hours on campus. We gave people, they were randomly assigned to one of four conditions. And so they received one of two different monetary amounts, either five or $20. And they were asked to spend the money in one of two fashions. So either on themselves by way of buying a gift for themselves or paying some of their expenses or on someone else by making a charitable donation or buying a gift for someone else. Um, they had all day to do it. They received the money with some spending instructions. Uh, we recruited them in the morning and they had until about five o'clock that evening or afternoon to go spend the money. Then a research assistant who was unaware of the amount of money and the spending instructions they received called them in the evening to find out how they were feeling. And what we found was that it didn't matter how much money people were given to spend uh, that predicted their happiness, but it was how people were randomly assigned to spend their money that mattered. Specifically, people who were told or asked to go spend money on others were significantly happier at the end of the day than people who spent a similar amount on themselves. 
So that was kind of our first bit of evidence to suggest that spending money generously might lead to higher levels of happiness than spending on oneself. And subsequently, we've been testing this question in kind of trying to push the boundary of un and understand how far reaching these results um, or this general sentiment might be. Uh, so for my dissertation research, we conducted some experiments in multiple places around the world. Um, we used some recollection designs where we asked people to recall a time they spent either on themselves or someone else and then report their happiness. We conducted studies like that in Canada, in South Africa, excuse me, in India, and I think also in South Africa, um, in Uganda. We also conducted some actual spending experiments in Canada and South Africa where people, uh, participants in our study who were students either in Canada or in South Africa were invited into the lab. They completed a questionnaire packet and they were told within uh, that they had received a small amount of money that they could keep for themselves or use to spend on a goodie bag that was filled with either chocolate, juice, or a combination of the two. And at this point, people were randomly assigned to either learn that the goodie bag was for them and they could take it home at the end of the experiment or that the goodie bag was for a sick kid at a local children's hospital here in Vancouver. That was the Canadian, uh, the Vancouver Children's Hospital. Right. Now, nearly everybody chose to buy the goodie bag for a charity if they were in the in the pro-social spending condition, and nearly everybody chose to buy the goodie bag if it was for them in the personal spending condition. And then we asked them to fill out a survey and tell us how they were feeling in the moment. And consistent with what we had seen with UBC students in the past, uh, people who were randomly assigned to buy all nearly equivalent items, the same items for charity, reported feeling happier than people who spent the same amount of money to buy items for themselves. Again, suggesting that we might feel good when we engage in this kind or generous behavior, and it perhaps might not just be limited to um, undergraduate students in Canada, but might be something we can detect in other places around the world. Um, and it, we intentionally recruited a low-income sample in South Africa to see uh, whether results might be any different in other places around the world. And, and, and importantly, even when people may actually have some challenges beating their own financial needs or their own um, financial challenges in their lives. And so that's just two illustrative studies, but we, we've studied this time and time again with different samples, uh, trying to understand how robust and extensive this finding might be, or whether there are some important limitations that we should be aware of. But by and large, we see that people on the whole tend to feel happier after they do kind things for others, specifically pro-social spending, than when they do the kind thing for themselves. Right. I guess, why is that in essence in in the whole um, um, form of it, if I do, if I, you know, spend something for someone else, why would that make me feel better? Because I, I mean, I've, I've obviously spent money on other people, and um, I understand the, especially on friends, close friends. Uh, I feel. Um, you know, I don't really feel as if it's I'm spending or I'm wasting money or I'm really spending it's it's as if I'm spending money on myself with my close friends. But there are times where um, I do I mean, if there's like, for instance, if I'm, you know, at dinner with a few friends and um, a couple of them maybe, you know, give give a little sign that they don't want to pay, I'll probably take the bill but I don't really feel like I should be paying um is there I guess f the first question why what indicate what um indicates someone being happy from that what what causes the happiness I guess if you if you guys know if you guys know that far into it so that's a, it's an interesting question and it's one we've been studying and um, the short answer is, is that I think we as humans are very social species. We are very interested in being um, liked and accepted by others. Some researchers, some famous papers have kind of made the case that we as humans have a need to belong. We don't just want to be included and liked by others, but we have this strong, deep held desire to really be liked and accepted by others. And when we don't feel that way, 
we retract, we withdraw, that might even kind of lead into these feelings of um, a lot of negative emotions, but actually to a large extent, uh, or over time and sustained periods, maybe even depression when people withdraw. And so there's kind of an understanding that we're this very social species that wants to like, uh, be liked and accepted by others. And I think that's part of one of the kind of helpful background pieces of information that allows us to understand that humans may find emotional rewards from doing kind things for other people, um, in part because it helps us kind of build and sustain these really important relationships in our lives. Um, and so it's certainly not the only way to show that we care uh, for the people in our lives or to demonstrate an interest in someone else's well-being. But I think by and large, generosity offers uh, a pretty clear path to kind of form connections with other people that we're just getting to know, but also help sustain the relationships with those that we care about uh, and we have longstanding relationships with. Right. Now, that isn't the case in every single circumstance, and I think that might help um, speak to some of the additional points that you were making in that last comment there, which is that I, I think I would not claim that every instance of generosity is going to make the actor or the spender feel good. Um, I think there are some kind of important preconditions that help us understand when giving is going to feel good and when it's less likely to feel good. Um, we've tried to study most of these in, in more um, familiar, but perhaps contrived ways in the lab and out in everyday life. So specifically, um, I think some of the giving is most likely to lead to happiness when people feel like they've chosen to do the kind deed, when people feel that their, their giving allows them to connect with other people that they care about or causes that they care about, and when um, people feel that they have had a positive impact. When any or all of those conditions are highly met, giving is much more likely to increase the giver's happiness. But there certainly are conditions where we feel forced to give or guilted to give. We might not feel so great about giving in those conditions. In fact, we might be resentful and upset and disappointed about it. Um, sometimes we can give in very socially connected ways. You might think about how you could go for dinner with your best friend or a relative or or just even a new colleague, someone that you're trying to get to know. Those opportunities for generosity that allow you to kind of build these social connections are especially relevant and worthwhile and emotionally rewarding. But there are also opportunities where we can give our money to other people in ways that are very disconnected. We make many donations to charities online where we never see or hear or connect with another person. Um, and I think those are perhaps a little bit more um, less satisfactory sometimes for our emotional well-being, not saying we're not having a positive impact. And finally, there are times where we can give in ways where we're not having a positive impact, or at least we're less aware of it. Um, I have a very <laughs> a very clear memory of a story uh, of an instance in which we were young and my mom gave a, a birthday gift to a close family friend of ours. Um, and it was a very practical gift. It was a clock. Um, but when given to the seven-year-old at the time, he burst into tears and was very disappointed <laughs> about the gift. Um, and so there are times where we might think we're doing a good thing um, and it not, is not received as such. Um, or sometimes, you know, it's just even, even we might be giving in less than um, obviously helpful ways. And I think some charities do a really good job of demonstrating how we're having a positive impact. And in those situations, we're very likely to feel good about giving. But there are other situations in where we kind of give into the ether and we never know uh, how our money or how our resources or how our investments are being used. And in those cases, I think it's a missed opportunity for how we could feel good about giving. Yeah. And I, so I don't know if that kind of for aligns sure. with your experience. Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um... With the charity thing for sure it's you don't really know where your money's going to i they you, you have a you, you trust the organization and you trust that they are handling the money or whatever mm -hmm. um the right way but yeah because you don't see it it's uh it's a little harder to uh be satisfied with it i guess does pro-social behavior also entail maybe giving someone a compliment you know doing their homework you know driving them offering them to offering to drive them somewhere is is that part of obviously that's part of pro-social behavior but is there have you done any research on whether um you know the non uh pro-social spending or the pro-social behavior which one gives more satisfaction or is it um, is it just strictly pure pro-social spending as of right now for the study? Uh, my research is focused primarily on the financial forms of generosity. Uh, it wasn't 
it wasn't my particular niche interest when I started doing this research. It just so happened that um, my research advisor at the time was very interested in questions surrounding money, and I was very interested in questions surrounding generosity. And so this seemed like a very natural intersection for our two interests. Um, and it also turns out to be practically helpful for studying this question because money is something that I can give participants and then ask them to go spend it. There are other resources that you could consider giving away that I think are also forms of generous behavior, but are much more questionable. <laughs> um, so I can't give people blood to then go give away. Um, I can't necessarily give people time, not not easily so, to then go give away. And so uh, it worked out nicely as kind of a tractable entry point for this area of investigation. That being said, uh, as we talked about, I think there are other forms of generosity. It's not just about giving money. People can give time, they can give advice, they can provide practical help, like you suggested, driving someone. Um, by and large, I think the evidence, the, the literature as it's growing, I think there's a more work on pro-social spending than other forms of generosity. Um, there's a lot of correlational work looking at whether giving time to other people is associated with higher levels of happiness. And by and large, it seems to be a very robust association. Um, but there have been relatively few experimental studies looking at whether giving time actually leads to higher levels of happiness. Um, and I think that's one area of research where research, uh, where experimenter, experiments are needed and researchers are focusing a lot more of their time to explore those questions. Um, other forms of generosity have received even less attention, but I think the few studies that are out there are relatively consistent with what I've already talked about before. So um, myself and my colleagues have run one or a few studies looking at young children and food sharing, um, and children smile more when they give food away to others than when they receive food themselves, which mm -hmm. is kind of consistent with what we were talking about with pro-social spending. There are some studies showing that people perform better when they give advice to other people than when they give advice to themselves. Um, and similarly, giving compliments leads to emotional benefits. All of these kind of align with what we've talked about already about pro-sociality being rewarding and perhaps more rewarding than directing the same resource, whatever it might be, to oneself. Um, but your other question about how to kind of benchmark these forms of, of pro-sociality against one another to consider which might be more emotionally rewarding than others, I think that's a really interesting point. And it's something I've thought about, but I think it's hard or tricky to explore in part because each of these resources may have different value to, to each individual and may also... Um, have have kind of different levels of these pro or profiles for the three kind of key criteria we talked about a few minutes ago. So first and foremost, um, there are some people who have very scarce time and might value their time as hundreds of dollars an hour, where there are lots where there might be other people who have an abundance of time and and perhaps less money and might not assume that their hourly wage would be uh, nearly as high. And so it's hard to think, to think about equating the emotional benefits of giving different resources if, if people conceptualize them differently. So that's, that's the first level of complexity in trying to understand which of these resources is more emotionally rewarding to give away. The mm. second is, I think, the very nature of giving away time, uh, as opposed to money, for instance, um, is that giving away time, for instance, volunteering, for most intents and purposes, often involves um, high levels of social connection and often provides high levels of that positive impact that we were talking about before. So normally when people volunteer, they're often doing it in the company of other people and oftentimes kind of giving directly to someone who is either the direct beneficiary or a proxy of. And so giving might might contain a lot of these really favorable profiles that we would think about um, giving in person might contain a lot of these favorable profiles for feeling good about giving. Whereas pro-social spending doesn't inherently need to have the same qualities. So we could very easily give money away to a charity where we give online and we have no idea how that money is being used. Um, so it, it, it's harder to compare. It, it's not apples and oranges, but they're it's very hard to quantify and, and conceptualize and, and benchmark these forms of giving against one another. At least certainly, I, I haven't seen a, someone do that perfectly, and I haven't figured out how to do it. I think it's a it's an interesting question, but I think the larger umbrella sentiment is that, see, it's, it appears that giving of our various resources to other people makes us happy. It tends to make the receivers happy as well. But whether we can splice and differentiate and identify one especially for valuable form of giving um, 
I, I don't know if I don't know if we've triangulated on that yet. And part of it might be um, just because the various ways in which we give, uh, we can mix and match the the favorable profiles for volition, for social connection, and for positive impact. For sure, does that make sense? Yeah, it, that it makes. Yeah, I, I for sure. So a lot there. <laughs> yeah. Um, w one of the things that I've always thought about I, since I was a kid, I always, um, I, I did feel the sense of, um, happiness when I did something for someone else. And I always thought to myself that, uh, you know, selfishly, I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something for someone else. So I feel better. So I just sometimes, do you think that some people or most people now knowing that themselves doing something for someone else makes them feel better is a self inherently a selfish thing because it's almost as if they don't really want to do it to make the other person feel better in a sense it's for them to make themselves feel better because of the other person feeling better i don't know if that makes sense but i just i always thought of that and Quickly, I just want to, because there is there is a Friends episode where um, Phoebe, I always have to bring up Friends because it's my favorite show. Um, <laughs> there is an episode where Joey and Phoebe are talking about um, there is no good deed. Um, so it, by the end of the episode, Joey's on, uh, he's doing this donation thing and he's, uh, he's on TV and uh, Phoebe actually hates donating to this charity because i i don't know what it was i don't think she stood for it It was for um some animal charity and she's a vegetarian or something anyways she donated a lot of money and because of that joey ended up going on tv and she hated the fact that she donated it but all of a sudden felt really happy because joey got on tv so it was, by the end of it, it was, she realized that there is no, uh, there is no good deed, even though she hated the fact that she donated, it made her really happy because, um, Joey got on TV. So I don't know if that makes sense. I, I think I understand your question. And I think that's an amazing insight that you picked up on really early on that giving <laughs> makes you feel good. I think what the research that my collaborators and I have conducted kind of suggests is that in broad strokes, most people recognize that giving can make us feel good. Uh, it's certainly good and not bad, um, but many of us have found that when we ask people about how they think they would feel and specifically which types of actions would make them happiest, spending money on themselves or spending money on others, most people think they'd be happier spending money on others and don't intuitively recognize when push comes to shove the emotional rewards of doing kind things for other people. Um, originally, you know, my, my colleagues and I kind of first documented this in, in the realm of pro-social spending, but even more recently, it turns out that people just have not the best insight into what makes them happy in by and large, which you probably remembered from 391 together. Uh, people don't recognize how rewarding it is to talk to strangers, for instance. Um, and part of that has to do with, you know, us being, again, a super social species and, and these opportunities for social connection make us happy. But when you encourage people or ask them whether they'd go out of their way to talk to a stranger, they say, nah, don't want to, heck no, mm. don't make me do that. Um, and the same seems to be true with pro-social spending. So in a broad sense, we realize that doing good makes us happy. But when we say, hey, you know, would you rather take five or twenty dollars to spend on yourself or someone else? What's going to make you happier? Overwhelmingly, people say they would rather spend the money on themselves. And so I think that's important because when push comes to shove and when most people are making decisions about whether or not to donate or how to spend their money, part of the reason perhaps people don't do this as much as they could or they should or they would like to is I think in the moment we fail to overlook the emotional rewards of generous spending. Um, and so I, I, well, I, I, to me, that raises some questions about whether most people are doing this for selfish motivations in the moment. Um, I don't think most people are going out of their way to give because it will make them feel good. I think by and large, most people give um, and then happen to feel good about it after. Mm. In fact, um, 
very few people kind of cite these emotional rewards of giving as like their primary reason for giving. And in fact, most people give because they care about the person, the cause, whatever it might be. And the warm glow of giving that we get afterwards just happens to be this kind of um, lovely accident, if you will, um, that they don't anticipate in advance. And so, I, yeah, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I, I don't think most people are giving for selfish reasons. I think they just happen to feel good afterwards. And I think that's a beautiful feature of human behavior. Um, in fact, some research with my former PhD student, Dylan Wewad, uh, we found that actually when people give for selfish motivations, they actually report feeling less happy afterwards mm. than people who give for these more pro-social, other-oriented motivations. And so... Um, even when people do give with these very different intentions, they seem to receive the, the the emotional rewards or the warm glow of giving seems to be dampened when they do it primarily for themselves. And so I think people engage in these kind deeds, not for the personal rewards they get. But if that is their motivation, they seem to get less of it. Right. I, I wanted to jump in, Dr. Acton, just for a second sure. here, because this is just a, this is totally anecdotal and just an observation that I have on people. Mm -hmm. I, I don't personally think this is necessarily pessimistic, but I I feel that most people are in like human beings, I think, are hardwired to be selfish. And I think that I mean, there's always oh, there's always a negative connotation uh, is generally considered a negative aspect of of your personality if you're con you know if someone calls you a selfish person but i without getting too political you even see this uh you know down in the u.s uh because they have a very different healthcare system that that uh, that we have uh, in canada and you see people that are completely opposed to a canadian type of healthcare system where we all pull our money together to have free healthcare essentially, right? And a lot of people's arguments are, why should I pay for your problem, right? Which I always find baffling because that is completely the opposite of how I work. I was raised as always being, you should always be generous, like, you know, just be gracious, give for the sake of giving, not because you wanna, I wanna see all of humanity benefit. And that's that's not a mindset that most people have. And I feel like we're just on this completely dark path. I don't know if if <laughs> what your thoughts are on that, but I'm, I'd be curious. Yeah, well, I think that's a very big question, a very interesting one. Um, I, well, first and foremost, I should say, I don't think I would not interpret my work and or the work of many others to say that we as humans don't have a selfish instinct. I think that would be foolish. I think we as humans have evolved to to take some care and and to be careful about how we ourselves are doing. Um, and I think we certainly have the selfish instinct. But I think what is often overlooked and what I think humans don't get credit for is that we, I think we also have this pro-social instinct. Um, and I think one of the reasons we feel good about giving is because we have evolved to be concerned about our standing with other people, to be concerned about how we connect with other people, because I don't think a human could have survived independently alone in our ancestral past. I think we need other people to get by and to survive. Um, and so I think humans have evolved to also have this pro-social interest and this pro-social instinct. Now, why there are certainly cross-cultural cross-country differences and variations in this, and I think you're you're pointing to the healthcare system as one really interesting example. Um, Canada is not the only one with a, a with this with a healthcare system that that is designed to help support those uh, that are in greater need and not just look out for themselves. I mean, many European countries do the same, and I think it's interesting and worth noting that uh, many European countries and and Canada rank higher than the United States on life satisfaction. If you look at the World Happiness Report and life evaluation ratings of most people around the globe, um, the United States, which tends to has have this privatized healthcare system where people are primarily looking out for themselves certainly rank lower than many of the European countries where there's a much uh, more heavily subsidized form of living through heavy taxation. And I think part of that is this embedded culture of caring for other people. Now, why is that more acceptable in some countries than others? I think there are likely a multitude of reasons. But one thing, um, w one interesting difference is I think there are strong cultural differences in norms and care of understanding. I think the United States has a real ethos of independence where I look after me and you look after you. Um, whereas I think 
Canada, certainly at least in comparison, has has perhaps a, a more um, supportive mindset where it's a little bit more perhaps of community. I also think the United States, perhaps because of its size and perhaps because of its politics or many other reasons, is a lot more polarized. Um, and I think when people start to find the cleavages and the fractures in their communities, they're a lot less likely to be interested in supporting people who they identify as different from them. And so I think finding these cleavages and, and differences are problematic in many regards, but part of that, I think part of one of the largest problematic outcomes of that is our lack of care and concern, or perhaps even tendency to villainize those who are different than us. Um, and that will certainly undercut our intentions or concerns for pro-sociality. Right. Just, just to piggyback on that, um, <laughs> I personally think, and I see it a lot in Vancouver, um, it is a very expensive place and I do feel that people here are becoming more and more less generous um, and becoming more like the states in terms of looking out uh, for themselves. Because it's such an expensive place, do you think there is justification in people acting like that and not being as generous as they should be because it is a stressful place to live in terms of living situation and just you know being so expensive so i don't know i just i think that um it could be justified i don't know well it Interestingly enough, donation rates over the past several years, and I, I realize this isn't exactly your question, but over the past several years, there has been some striking data showing inequality levels increasing substantially through COVID. Um, many people who were essential workers who were living on um, with unstable or unpredictable incomes uh, were, were took a huge brunt during to, took a huge hit during COVID, whereas some people who were financially doing well beforehand have even have amassed larger sums during COVID. Um, so inequality, I think, has risen through COVID, but so has prosociality, which in some ways seems really contradictory. I don't know if we know exactly why that is. Um, but all this to say that at some level, inequality, while inequality levels have gone up, so too have some levels of prosociality, at least over the past several years. That might be an interesting and isolated event, or they might be related. I don't know if we exactly know. Um, but the question about whether living costs and, and reduced rates of prosociality are connected is an interesting one. Um, I suspect, you know, in the real world, a lot of these questions are complicated, and there are many variables moving in different directions. Um, it's certainly possible that stress has something to do with it, which I think is what you were suggesting. Mm. I'm not 100% sure of, of exactly how. Um, I don't know of any data kind of relating those things. Um, but I do know of some work um, conducted in my lab, but also in many others, showing that as um, when there are when there are high levels of inequality, one reason that people might not take direct aim at dealing with these questions is that we have a tendency to assume that people uh, have earned and are responsible for and deserving of the financial stations in, in, that, that they have. So we might think that the rich are rich and they deserve to be there because they're hardworking, upstanding, admirable people. And we might assume those with less who are dealing with financial scarcity might deserve to be in those positions, perhaps um, because they are lazy, perhaps they're incompetent or just less deserving. Um, the tendency to make these internal attributions to assume people are where they are and they they have earned it um, is a demonstration of what social psychology has long uh, called the fundamental attribution error, this or the correspondence bias, this idea that we very quickly assume the people are where they are, or they um, they almost deserving of where they are. Yeah, they deserve or, or like their behavior reflects the the internal person that they are. And so if you mm. happen to be low income, it, it must be because you are um not capable of doing anything else. Um, unfortunately, we know that that's often not the case. When people are born into poverty, there's some striking data, especially from the United States, that if you're born into some of the lowest levels of income, um, the chances of you emerging from some of the lowest quintiles in America are almost impossible given how society is structured. There's just so little chance for social mobility in places um, that are so stratified. 
like the United States. Um, and so the problem is, is that when people hold these strong attribution ideas that people are where they are and they deserve to be there, that certainly undercuts pro-sociality. So people are a lot less willing to help someone uh, who is deal dealing with financial insecurity or financial strain if they believe that the person deserves to be there. Um, they might think that this individual has wasted their chances, um, that they don't deserve another chance. So why should I go out of my way to provide financial resources to this person um, who should be able to take care of themselves who, or who should step up and pull themselves up by their bootstraps. When in reality, we know that the situation almost never or very infrequently allows someone to kind of climb up from these dire straits. Um, however, research by Dylan, as I mentioned before, my um, my previous PhD student has suggested that if we make clear the f the hurdles, the struggles that people who are uh, facing low levels of income have to deal with, this can help break down those barriers and change people's attributions. So in one interesting study that was in his dissertation, we asked people to play this really fascinating game online called uh, Spent. You can actually play, I believe it's still freely available online. It's at a website I believe it's spent.org. And basically, the challenge is for you to make it through a month as someone who earns very little. Um, and you have to make some very tough choices, like your child is sick. Do you do you miss a day of work and risk losing your job? Or do you choose to leave your child at home by themselves and hope that, you know, nobody, nobody raises this concern and your landlord doesn't have an issue with it. Um, you know, when people begin playing this game, they often think I've got this, it's no big deal. But in our LART, we asked over 600 students at SFU to play this game. Um, and very few of them were able to make it through the month. Mm -hmm. And I think when people realize the challenges that many people are facing, that it's not just it's not, it's not that someone has, uh, the, not that someone is incompetent or incapable or unmotivated, but that these are just very, very challenging situations. People can break free from these attributions and make uh, much more admirable attributions and engage in much more generous behavior. And so I think our knee-jerk reaction perhaps might be to make these very stable assumptions about other people. Uh, we overlook the challenging situations people are in, but when we can break free from that, we can start to be a lot kinder to other people. Mm, right. I think to to recap too what you're what you're saying. I mean, based on that study, that SFU study, you were saying about 600 students couldn't make it through mm -hmm. the month. I mean, I think that just goes to show you that it's so much easier to pass judgments on someone on how they live, their life cycle, their lifestyle, their their circumstances. You don't really know that much about them, and until you're actually put in a very diff difficult position. You don't really truly appreciate how how challenging somebody's life can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. Uh, just a quick segue. I know we don't have that much time. This is something that I've been, you know, trying to understand myself. And as I'm getting older, I keep going back and forth. But does money buy happiness? I there's I know there's both sides to it, and there could be a four hour discussion on this. But mm -hmm. just quickly. What do you say about that? Can money buy happiness? I think my short answer would be, yes, it can, if you spend it wisely. Um, and part of our discussion today was about one way in which you can spend it wisely, and that is on other people, by fostering our connections and building relationships, investing in the things you care about, whether that be a cause that is near and dear to your heart or a relationship that's important to you. Uh, but there are also other ways in which we can use money to support and, and further our happiness that really, we really didn't get into today. But part of that is buying experiences as opposed to buying material items and doing things that uh, you can use your money to buy you out, if you will, of some of the negative realities of everyday life, like some of the chores and the annoyances um, with extra money in your pocket. Sometimes you can circumvent those stresses and those frustrations. Right. And one of the things I remember um, in the course, uh, I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but at a certain point, um, a, a, a set amount of um, your income, whatever you make more than that, it doesn't actually make you uh, happier. It's... Uh, there was a there was a number that like at a certain am amount that you make your uh, salary income anything more than that it it you s feel the same way. Yes, so there was a famous paper by Kahneman and Deaton that came out. Uh, I believe it was in 2010, arguing that beyond seventy five thousand dollars a year of 
uh, of income, the relationship between money and happiness kind of flattens off. There's declining marginal utility is is um, what is often said. Those findings are, are interesting, important. They're a little bit more complicated than just that simple take home message. Certain forms of well-being do continue to increase, but other forms do not. But yeah, it, it kind of suggests at some point there might be a satiation level at which earning more money doesn't really translate to much in the way of happiness returns. Um, and that's one of one of the take home messages of that week in, in 391 was it's it's less about how much money it is that you earn. I mean, certainly below the below the poverty line, there's a pretty steep relationship between earning more money and reporting higher levels of happiness because income allows you to provide some stability and, and basic needs of housing, of food, of, of, of some important safeties in life. But beyond a certain point, earning a lot more money doesn't seem to buy a lot more happiness. And, and part of that is, is because um, people might not be spending their money in ways that lead to lasting levels of higher levels, uh, lasting uh, higher levels of happiness. We might be spending in ways that are kind of just um, not as effective mm, and over so things are, we don't need or even things that are unhealthy and yeah um, and and sometimes just earning more money can be a lot more stressful sometimes people are in higher stress jobs um, or they're just chasing the next best thing thinking that that will bring them higher levels of happiness but often um, as soon as we meet or achieve whatever that goal we think will bring us happiness is rather than be happy and satisfied and relish and celebrate those moments we just turn our eyes on the next best thing constantly striving um, and seeking something else absolutely okay that makes sense that makes me feel a little bit better so <laughs> just wanted to thank you for coming on that was fantastic we'll have to do this again and make that a part two Oh, that sounds like fun. Thank you, Dr. I am so Jackson. sorry to read. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. This was lots of fun to chat. And I'm sorry to rush off, but I've got a student in my Zoom waiting room. But I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Absolutely. I appreciate Take it. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.